Knowledge is power. Make an impact by learning more or hire us to do it for you. Let us focus on what we do best so you can stay focused on what you do best. Find all of our options under services, one-to-one -one training, subscription-based training, or accounting and business consulting. Hey, Seth David here from the world-famous Nerd Enterprises Incorporated, and welcome to QuickBooks Online Products and Services Deep Dive. We're going to take a look at products and services, especially if you're an e-commerce company, then you should be concerned with this. Anybody who sells products should be concerned with this. And it's not that you have to become an accountant, but I want you to have a deep enough understanding of this stuff that A, you can tell when something doesn't look right, and B, when something doesn't look right, you have some idea of where to go to troubleshoot it, some idea of the back end and foundation of how this all works in QuickBooks Online, so that C, ultimately, you can go to your accountant if that accountant is not me. If you need an accountant, give us a call, but you can go to your accountant and have a more intelligent conversation with them so that you waste less time, frankly, and you can get right down to brass tacks and say, hey, what's going on? My sales don't look right. Or my inventory says I have this much in QuickBooks Online, but I know I don't have nearly that much in the warehouse or whatever it is. Those are the two carriers. Either your sales don't look right or your inventory doesn't look right. Those are the two most common triggers that are going to make you want to know where to look in QuickBooks Online to have a little better understanding of how things get to where they go in QuickBooks Online. And that is rooted in your products and services. So let's take a look. Let's go over here to the sales area. And you'll see when I move my mouse over sales, it gives me all four tabs. I can look at all sales invoices, customers, or go straight to products and services. Now, once there, notice across the top here, I've got access to everything having to do with customers and sales. All right here. QuickBooks Online makes it very easy to manage this stuff. So if I want to create a new item that I sell online, I'm going to click New. And it's going to be an inventory part. And a simple way to look at this is that inventories, uh, I items, inventory products are anything that you need to track a quantity for, right? So let's just call this, let's say we have light bulbs, right? So I have Edison light bulbs. Uh, actually, here I type the whole thing out. Okay, and I'll put ELB as my SKU. Important with your SKU to have it be at least three characters. If not already, at some point you may want to link an app up to QuickBooks Online to help manage your inventory. And when you do, a lot of times when you're linking it to your item list or product list in QuickBooks Online and you're trying to pull it up in a drop down, it needs at least three letters to execute a search. Uh, so if your SKU is only two letters and you're searching on the SKU, that's a problem. You'll wind up having to scroll the list in order to find what you're looking for. Your categories, I didn't really get into in the write-up. And by the way, I strongly urge you to read the write-up. There's a lot of sort of background and context in there that I'm not going to get into here. So because I'm sort of doing this on the assumption that you've read the write-up and so you have that familiarity. Great thing to do, by the way, is if you have two monitors, put the write-up up on one screen, have the video up on the other, and pause and play so you can kind of follow along and even maybe, heaven forbid, open up your own QuickBooks Online company and do what I'm doing. Make sure that it all really makes sense to you. When you're creating a new item, uh, a new product where you're tracking quantity, it's going to want to know if there's an initial quantity on hand. I strongly urge you to put zero there. If you do already have this product on hand, chances are you should go and enter the bills for when you purchase those products so you can enter and pay them. If it's something that you got and paid for a long time ago and for some reason you're just setting it up now, I'd still encourage you to set it up this way with zero initial quantity on hand. And then you can I can show you another video for another day or reach out to me for one-on-one -on -one help on this. I can show you how to do it in a way that's a lot cleaner. When you put it in here like this, QuickBooks Online is going to create an entry and stick it through opening balance equity, which there's really no better way to do it. But I don't love the way it does the entry when you because that entry then is tied to this very item in its setup. I'd rather not have it tied to the actual initial item setup as a transaction, but have a separate transaction for it. So that's my story and I'm sticking to it. You also have to put a date here with for the as of date. And I strongly urge you to backdate that as far back as you can, because if you are catching up and creating this item, even though you've had activity maybe for six months in the item and you're just behind on your accounting, if you put in today's date in a case like that, you're going to have problems because when you go to record the bill or a sale of that item, of this item, and this date is here and your bill or, or, or sale is from a date prior to this, uh, QuickBooks Online is going to stop and you have to go back in and edit this and update the date. So just backdate this. I've never had a case where I've needed this and I frankly don't know why they force you to do it. Um, but anyway, 
it's there and you have to do it. So do it, but take my advice. Backdate it as far back as you can. Uh, don't need a reorder point. Can put one there if you want to. Most importantly, I want to focus on what I gave you in the write-up, where I described that in setting up a product that gets sold, you have three accounts to be concerned with. The inventory account, as I mentioned, is an asset account. It's where it goes when I've purchased it and it sits on my balance sheet. Right, So when I enter a bill to pay for the item, this is the account it's going to go to. Normally, you just want to leave it at inventory asset. A common exception would be is if you have a manufacturing process where you have three different types of inventory, raw materials, work in process, and finished goods. In that case, you would have three different inventory asset accounts, and obviously you'd have different items for each of those sort of phases. So based on what item you're creating and what phase that item is meant to sit in, that's how you would choose your inventory asset account. You can put in sales information, but as I also mentioned in the write-up, not necessary, especially if you're selling these on a sales channel like your own website or Amazon or eBay or something. Let the sales descriptions go there. The only time this is really useful is if I'm going to be sending invoices to customers for the sale of this product directly out of QuickBooks Online. Then I'd want the sales information on here because that will populate on the invoice. Normally, I suggest leaving the standard sales price or rate alone, especially if you have different prices you sell this for, depending on where it's sold and whatnot. Leave it blank. It's, it'll force you to have to stop and enter it in cases where it would otherwise be pulling this information in, such as when you're invoicing for it. Um, it'll force you to stop and think and make sure you've got the right number in there. The income account, notice when I'm setting up a, an inventory part, I'm restricted here to only include income accounts in setting this up. On this particular company file, I only have one income account called sales of product income. Obviously, yours is probably going to be a little bit more clever than that. But the point being that you can only link for income account purposes to an actual income account. And you're going to see where that's distinguished uh, when I show you the service item setup. Purchasing, who do I buy the inventory from? It's assumed with inventory that you're buying it from somewhere if you're not making it. Even when you make your own inventory, you have to buy the parts or the raw materials, right? So most items, pretty much all items that are inventory parts of any kind need the purchasing side. And you can put a description that'll come up when you enter the bill for the purchase of this item, but again, not necessary. Cost, same thing. I encourage you to keep that out of there unless you know absolutely it's always going to cost the same. And then the expense account, in this case, really has to be a cost of goods sold account. And in the drop down, you'll see I'm restricted to only cost of goods sold account types. You set up the account type when you set up an account in the chart of accounts. Again, another video for another day. But rest assured, this expense account, the terminology here is a little misleading. For an inventory part, it really has to be cost of goods sold. And again, in the write up, I explain cost of goods sold in a little bit more depth and what that really means. And of course, you can put a preferred vendor in here if there's a particular vendor that you know you always or prefer to buy this item from, that can be useful to have, but it absolutely isn't necessary. So I'll save and close this. And now I have my ELB, my Edison light bulbs inventory item set up. I can start to record purchases and sales of this item right away. Now we also talked about a service item. I gave the example of let's say there's some labor that needs to be applied such as I need to screw the light bulbs into the little fixtures that I'm sending out on my Edison lights for people like the one I got. You saw the picture in the write-up. Again, go look at the write-up. You'll see what I'm talking about. So assuming I wanted to charge for that, if it was some kind of customized or highly skilled labor that I'm applying, probably obviously not the case with my Edison lights, but um, Let's just say that we needed to uh, charge for the labor. I can add a, an item in for that, right? And we'll call this, uh, I don't know, uh, labor on products, right? LOP, something like that. Again, we don't really need to skew for a service item. It's not as important as it is for a, you know an actual product that I sell. But for the sake of being consistent, I like having rules that apply universally. So my rule on this is just everything gets a skew no matter what. That way it's clear I didn't just forget it. Now, here comes the magic part. So, of course, I sell this product or service to my customers. It's checked off. I can put a description that would explain, you know, labor, screwing the light bulb in, whatever it is. Um, again, sales price or rate, I can, leave in, I can put in a standard or leave it blank. But this is where I really want your attention is on the fact that this income account can be absolutely any account on the chart of accounts, right? Notice I have... I could even uh, link it to an equity account. Now, why would I do this? For the income account for something like this labor, I probably want to have some income account that's specific for labor, right? So I might want to even call it labor uh, on fixtures or something like that, right? Or just labor. 
and I can add that real quick. And that's going to be an income account. It's going to be a service or fee income, right? And I can save that. And now that's linked and I can save and close. But the reason I wanted your attention in the case of the service item on the fact that it can you, it gives you access in that income drop down to every account in the chart of accounts is this is where we can get a little creative and this is what I mentioned at the very bottom of the write up. If I want to, if I take prepayments from customers, I can create a service item. I can call it prepayments, right? I can call this PPMT for prepayment, and. I have already a liability account set up called prepayments. So even though it says income account here for a service item, I can link this to any account on the chart of accounts, which means I can create an item that can be used to capture a prepayment or a deposit from a customer. And then I can use that item when I record the sale as a negative amount to reduce the prepayments and also reduce the amount due on that invoice or that sales receipt. So it's really useful. And, you know, check, I'm going to actually put out, as of this recording, uh, a video soon on handling uh, customer deposits or prepayments in QuickBooks Online. I've done it before, but I don't have one in the current blog, and they've always, they're have always they always updating the interface. So it, uh, it turns out I realized I don't have it on my blog, so I'm going to put it on my blog soon. And when I do, I'll go back to this post and link to it. So it may be that by the time you're watching this, it's already there. So again, go back to the write-up, check the write-up. If it's there, you'll see the link there. If not, reach out to me and I'll let you know as soon as it goes live if I know that's something you're interested in. The other thing, and I'll go back to the labor item that we created for this, is notice there's an option further down, uh, purchasing information. I can check off that I purchased this. This is if I pay somebody outside of my company. So it's not an employee who's being paid payroll, but somebody outside the company I might pay to screw the light bulbs into the fixtures, which would be a little silly, but you get the point. Uh, then I would check this box off, and that way it will be available as an item to be used in an expense-related transaction like a bill or a credit card charge. And then I would choose the expense account. And the expense account might be, I wouldn't call it purchases, probably be something like outside labor or something along those lines. And since it's labor related specifically to getting the product ready to ship to a customer, technically by that definition, it's not cost of goods sold anymore. But a lot of people would want to put it there because we're not doing things necessarily according to GAAP, which is generally accepted accounting principles. We're doing things according to how we want to manage our business and understand what it costs us to get a product sold. So along those lines, you can break the rules until you go public and you could put a, a cost like this in cost of goods sold just so that you could see what your true gross margin is on that item. So uh, just a little uh, extra tip there on that. If you ever decide to go public, first of all, that's awesome. Uh, second of all, when you do, you'll need to change the classification of those costs and you'll no longer be allowed to call them cost of goods sold because cost of goods sold are defined as the costs necessary for getting a product ready for sale. And if this is something that's happening after it's sold, we, you know, we, we stock the fixture and the light bulbs on our shelves. We don't screw the bulb into the fixture until somebody's bought one then by definition, that's something that's happened after the sale is made, which means it's not a necessary cost for getting it ready for sale. And if I never sell a single one of these, I'll never incur that cost. So by that definition, it goes lower down in the income statement into the selling in general and administrative expenses. So again, I'm not trying to say that if you're an e-commerce business owner that you need an accounting degree, but I think you'll agree having heard what I've just explained. And if you go through the write-up, that having this knowledge is really useful so that you have a better, clearer picture of when and whenever your, in, your financial information doesn't look right. And as I said earlier, also, so you can have a more intelligent conversation with people like me so that we can get to the root of things faster and more efficiently. And when something doesn't look right, when something isn't right, we can get to the root cause and we can get it fixed quickly, promptly, and efficiently. Because I know that especially in the e-commerce world, real-time, very fast information data is key to your success. So that's what I make every effort at providing is really good data, real time, and good reporting. All of that goes along with that. So as always, I hope you learned something here, had some fun along the way. I hope you're having an absolutely fantastic day, and I look forward to seeing you on the web.